Welcome everyone to the 14th DEM I Wonder webinar. DEM has so many services, offerings, programs, and hidden gems that we want to share with all of you. So we're excited to take just a few minutes each week to highlight these features in our weekly webinar. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many exercises have been postponed or canceled. The Utah Division of Emergency Management is hosting this weekly webinar series aimed at providing local emergency managers with relevant content and opportunities to enhance their capabilities. Webinars will be live for Q&A and will be recorded for later viewing on the DEM website and YouTube channels. Most of these webinars will be seminars or workshops with a hands-on portion, which will allow emergency managers to become oriented to a DEM process or test a DEM product. Our schedule today will be as follows. We'll start with our ground rules and etiquette, Next, we'll have a brief presentation by John Crofts on I wonder what is the Utah Seismic Safety Commission and why does it matter? Following the presentation, there will be a hands-on portion where participants will be encouraged to test out the product or process that was presented. Following the hands-on portion of our program, the presenter will be available for a Q&A session. Following the Q&A, we'll close with a short message about upcoming webinars. The ground rules today are fairly simple. Please mute your line while the presenter is presenting. If you have a question, you may type it in the group chat or unmute at the appropriate time to ask your question. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website for future viewing. Thank you all for your attendance today. And with that, we'll turn the time over to John Crofts. Oh, you are on mute, John. Okay, great. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate that introduction. And um, I'm John Crofts. I work with the state of Utah. I've worked in uh, the Division of Emergency Management now for going on 18 years, 17 years already. And um, I've enjoyed every moment of it. And I, I wanted to share something that would be useful today to everybody. And um, many of you may have uh, heard about the Utah Seismic Safety Commission. And uh, if you have, maybe we can, I can expand a little bit more onto what our commission does and how it operates and what we do and the benefits that we offer the state of Utah. And um, I'd like to just go through, I have a, a bunch of things. And uh, on this first slide, uh, I have emergency management kicker. and. Uh, the kicker is with public works, we, we really should be best friends with public works if we work in emergency management. And I know that we all talk about cooperating and coordinating with each other, but the Seismic Safety Commission uh, really does, you know, have a lot of different um, fingers and a lot of different pies. And we really try to work together and help each other and coordinate with each other. So with that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the earthquake risks that we have. Um, the important uh, point that I'd like to make is this is a, a map of the Wasatch Front. And, is, and you can see that 80% uh, of our population in our state lives along the Wasatch Fault area. 75% of our economy is located in this area. And um, a point that I, I kind of wanted to make because it's kind of an important issue is that we have 200,000 unreinforced masonry homes and buildings or 20% of the structures in uh, along the Wasatch Front are these unreinforced masonry buildings. And uh, they pose an extreme risk during an earthquake as well. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that because that's something that um, I'll cover a little bit later, um, but the, the URMs are, are, are gonna cause a big problem when we do have a larger earthquake. So <clears throat> what is the USSC, the Utah Seismic Safety Commission? It was established um, House Bill 358 in 1994. And um, the, uh, uh, the, so it was established in 1994. And then in 2000, we had House Bill 200 and the Utah uh, Code Title three, uh, 63C, Chapter 6. And it's an advisory board. We have no regulatory or statutory authority. And we have 15 commissioners representing 15 different organizations within the commission. And um, each one of the organizations is somebody that brings something special to the commission. We have insurance, 
we have emergency management, we have the seismograph stations, we've got um, a, a large variety of people on there, you know, from the APA and, and other groups as well. So it's 15 strategic groups that can come together and use our collective knowledge to help reduce seismic risks in the state. That's the whole point. Um, just here's a here's a bunch of our logos that we have with people that participate. And um, I just wanted to point this one out. Um, there's a triangle here. So we have three main organizations that are within the commission that offer support and staff to the commission. We have the University of Utah Seismograph Stations. We have uh, Utah DNR and we have the Utah Division of Emergency Management. And then, you know, we have other organizations that participate as well, the American Society of uh, Professional Engineers and, and quite a few others. So um, it's uh, our primary mission is to advocate for earthquake awareness and preparedness. And we like to review earthquake related hazards and risk, prepare recommendations to identify and mitigate hazards and risk. And then we also prior prioritize our recommendations uh, for adoption as policy or loss reduction strategies. And the commission acts as a source of information for earthquake safety and the promotion of earthquake loss reduction me measures. Um, I wanted to mention something that, that's pretty important. Uh, we have the probability report. This can be found on the website and I'm gonna list the website a little bit later here and where you can find it. But the probability of the major earthquake, which is a magnitude 6.75 or greater, it's uh, projected to be much larger than previously predicted. And um, a larger area of potential earthquakes is also included in this report. And uh, something that I think that is worth all of us paying some attention to is a, a magnitude 6.5 is almost uh, three times bigger than a magnitude 6.3 earthquake like they had in New Zealand. Um, so anyway, when, when we talk about magnitude, uh, you know, every, every uh, point on a magnitude earthquake is almost five times more the energy release. Uh, a major earthquake is a big deal. They're quick, they're deadly, and they're costly. And um, there's a human toll that we all suffer with earthquakes too. And unlike floods, we cannot predict earthquakes to the uh, same degree of accuracy that we can predict a, a flood with. So um, it, it, just something that was interesting when we had our, our magnitude 5.7 earthquake for Magna uh, just this last year, um, there was an email that went out and everyone was predicting that we would have a magnitude nine earth, or the email incorrectly stated that this earthquake would be followed by a magnitude nine earthquake. And um, there's two things wrong with that. Um, Utah is not within the ring of fire. We, we are not on a Pacific, we're not on a tectonic plate. It's impossible for our state to suffer a magnitude nine earthquake. So, um, you know, but we, we can suffer a magnitude seven or, or, or greater. So we do have a high earthquake hazard risk, but it, it was interesting uh, to point out that uh, the point I wanted to say is we cannot predict earthquakes. We don't know when or where they will necessarily happen. The um, 7.0 magnitude, sir, the, the scenario report that we have, and that's also on the website, I'll, I'll reference that later, but they're predicting with a seven earth, uh, magnitude seven earthquake would have a $33 billion economic hit and would have over 10,000 fatalities and life-threatening injuries. And I'd like to just say that it's pretty hard to predict how many uh, fatalities we would have. Um, we were very fortunate in the last earthquake, in the, in the Magna earthquake, that we did not have one fatality. And I think that uh, one good thing, I guess, from the pandemic that came is that, you know, the schools were not in session. A lot of people were not um, out on the streets doing things. And so, you know, there, there, were, there was damage that could have killed many, many people. And, Fortunately, we did not suffer one fatality with that earthquake. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to point out the, the 10,000 fatalities and life-threatening injuries that we would have, a large portion of those would be, be because of our unreinforced masonry 
properties where it's just brick on brick and there's no reinforced uh, materials holding those buildings up. And those are typically buildings that are built before 1972. So support for the seismic safety efforts that um, the, the commission supports. We have the schools, the rapid visual screenings. We're in the process of working with those. The, the commission's working on that. We have the Utah Geologic Survey. Um, they conduct uh, studies and trenches for seismic study and review. We have the Fix the Bricks program, which is in Salt Lake City. We're looking to hopefully expand that program to a statewide program. We have the ATC 20, the training and credentialing, credentialing for post-earthquake evaluation needs and also our annual Utah Shakeout that we support. Um, we also promote earthquake awareness with a variety of publications, social media and outreach programs. Uh, the commission also advocates for legislation uh, such as the parapet ordinance. Parapet is, uh, are, the, are those designs that hang over on buildings typically. And um, you know, they, they're, they're usually very pretty and they look nice, but they create a earthquake hazard. So um, the Seismic Safety Commission also uh, advocates for the reauthorization of the uh, NEHRP. Uh, so NEHRP is um, a, a funding program that uh, provides funding to the seismograph stations, to the state of Utah, Division of Emergency Management and others. And um, Here's a few other publications that we have. I, I wanted to point out this front one that says the Earthquake Emergency Handbook. That was developed by um, uh, the Western States uh, policy, the Western States Policy Council, by WISPIC, by the State of Utah, and by the Utah Seismic Safety Commission. And what that publication is for is that is for small rural communities. If we have an earthquake. And uh, what are my immediate steps? What do I need to do immediately? So before the state can arrive and help, before FEMA can arrive and help, what do I need to do? So that's a, a brochure and a, a, that's a little pocket handbook that just gives you some very quick resources to go through and what do I need to do immediately following an earthquake? So I recommend if, I, I think our liaisons were handed those and, and sent those out to a lot of their communities and. We have those online and we also have a, a supply of those at the state that we can still provide any of you if you would be interested in that. We also share those booklets throughout the Western region and for anybody else that wants to use those. So there's, um, and I already mentioned the earthquake probabilities report. Uh, we also have the putting down roots uh, and uh, a few other publications that are available online. Uh, this publication up on the upper right, that is the um, unreinforced masonry uh, dwellings book and that talks about these URMs and you can see there's that uh, brick building and it has a bunch of boards that are holding up the brick after a moderate earthquake and uh, that talks about um, the severe risk that these URMs pose to everybody. And when you think about 20% of the buildings in Utah represent those URMs, it's pretty, it's quite a sobering thought. The Seismic Safety Commission uh, partners with cities, towns, and counties, the state of Utah. We also uh, partner with neighboring states and federal agencies. Uh, the Seismic Safety Commission uh, meets with Nevada uh, every other year about. And uh, I'd like to also mention that Arizona recently started their own seismic safety commission and they leaned on the state of Utah to help do that. They looked at the way we had set up our organization and they used ours as a template to help them. So uh, we also share trainings and meetings with each other. Uh, we're gonna have these earthquake training courses that are gonna, gonna be coming up this year. And we've partnered with, the, and they're gonna be online classes through the NETAP program. And um, we're gonna have uh, seismic safety for schools and ATC 20 is gonna be offered as well. And we are sharing our courses between Nevada and Arizona. So anybody from, uh, you know, I think we're limited to three courses for our state. And so we're opening up our trainings and sharing those with Nevada and they're sharing theirs with us. And so, we're just offering more uh, regional trainings throughout our states. And so I think that's a pretty good 
uh, partnership that we have going on with some of our other states. We also have, I, I mentioned the Western State Seismic Policy Council. It's basically the Western United States and the islands. I think that um, British Columbia also from Canada also participates. And so um, it's a pretty good group and we really uh, leverage and, and work to share our strengths with each other. Um, one of the important things about the Seismic Safety Commission that we really press upon is we want to be prepared and to withstand uh, an earthquake. So building codes and mitigation, uh, they really do matter. Uh, you know, sometimes everybody thinks that, um, you know, well, my, my home is built or my building is built after 1972 and now is there anything more I can do? Of course there is. There's always mitigation efforts that we can do. And uh, the commission uh, really supports and, um, and you know, offers to their support and encouragement for people to mitigate. I, I wanted to mention a few mitigation things that they're doing right now. Um, if anybody's in downtown Salt Lake City, you might recognize the Salt Lake City Temple as going through a major seismic retrofit. They're putting a state-of-the-art uh, base isolation system into that temple to protect it. That building is basically an unreinforced masonry building, and if we had an earthquake, it would be a tragedy to lose that historic building. So they are doing one of the nation's uh, best uh, base isolation systems and the same base isolation system that state capital has um, Salt Lake Temple is going to have a system that's even improved upon that and that's exciting the Salt Lake City Airport's also going through a rebuild and they are uh, building that airport to withstand um, a large earthquake in magnitude 7 plus and they want to have that airport operational again uh, within 48 hours of an earthquake so the Salt Lake City Airport's really um, taking this mitigation seriously as well. The new prison that's being built, they've also taken strong mitigation efforts with that building. So we have projects and uh, mitigation programs throughout the state that are going on right now to prepare for this earthquake. Um, we also encourage the uh, public and business to respond, first responders, everyone, it's, it's all in. And um, recovering from a 30, $3 billion economic hit and the human toll, it's going to be significant. And the commission wants to keep raising the awareness of that. And, you know, if we prepare before the earthquake and we're prepared for it, the rebound will be much quicker if we're ready before. Um, and I, I wanted to mention a little bit about public works, you know, emergency management, we're all emergency managers and we like to, um, understand what we do and you know public works is key to emergency management and I, I think that we probably already understand that and we all know that i think that we all work with our public works people and we know how important they are they're they are pivotal in helping us recover from a disaster they uh, clear transportation corridors they do damage assessments debris removal infrastructure repair and uh one other thing I also wanted to mention is, uh, you know, and I think this is important for emergency managers to understand that the, the Utah Public Works have a mutual aid agreement amongst themselves. So if one community uh, is suffering something significant and another community has more resources to help, uh, Public Works can send their Public Works vehicles and equipment and materials to other communities to help them recover. So Utah is very forward thinking, our communities are very forward thinking and the public works are forward thinking knowing that, you know, a disaster could overwhelm their resources and who else in the community can reach out and, and get help from. So I, I just think that, you know, we don't have to know all the specifics on that, but it's good for us to know that uh, our public works are all tied in with these other public work works entities and that we can um, lean on each other for help if we ever need it. Just wanted to point out some of the, this is another unreinforced masonry building that was damaged. Um, we had a lot of these. This is an older picture, but um, a lot of similar damage in the magnet earthquake. Um, the public works people um, have a lot of things. This is just, a, as you can imagine, all the snow. So they can actually use their snow plows to clear roads of debris and everything. And so I, I thought that was something good. This is another picture of an earthquake. Um, 
you know, who's going to fix that? Well, if, if you have something like that, you call Public Works and they're on it. They can handle that. So if you have a main artery or something, main road damage, uh, Public Works can help restore those supply chains and, and roads and help you return. I wanted to point this out. This is, from, this is from the flooding that we had in the 80s. This is downtown Salt Lake City. And uh, there's a reason that I wanted to point this out. So even though this is not earthquake related, um, they had runoff in 80, 1983 that was so severe, they um, actually just built a river right down downtown Salt Lake City. And they were able to discharge the floodwaters and, and prevent serious loss. Now, this was a complicated um, system that they did, but I wanted to point out that um, in 2000, uh, 11, we had, oh gosh, what was it? It was 11 times more snow pack in the mountains than, than average. And so, uh, you know, public works, um, we, we just had the perfect melt off. We had hot days and then cold days and hot days and cold days. And um, also, you know, they had a lot of um, water that went through. And the, the funny thing is, is this is an example of government employees doing a great job Nobody took vacation in public works. Nobody took time off. Everybody was working their heads off. They were keeping stream channels clear. Uh, they were doing everything. And they had also done some improvements on, on uh, flood drainages and everything. So we didn't have any major, major flooding that um, caused severe problems. So, so we were actually quite fortunate. So we learned from those lessons, we mitigated those lessons, and um, it's an example of government doing a great job. So I don't know if Public Works ever got the shout out that they deserved. Um, you know, we were always worried that we were gonna have severe flooding and we could have, but um, it was an example of government and Public Works coming together so well that there wasn't anything serious. But um, I guess we only hear it when people do badly, but um, you know, when we had, all that water coming down, uh, it was handled so well. And so a lot of our emergency managers didn't have to do really severe measures in that. And so I wanted to point that out. So our mitigation efforts really paid off with the flooding and we can do that with earthquake too. Um, just a few, we all remember the tornado that went through Salt Lake and you know, public works played a key role in recovering from that. Um, this is an example of the public works people skipping their vacations and skipping their their time off and, and making sure that the channels were open so that there were not further disasters. This is a picture from St. George. I like this one. Um, this one says for sale, S-A-I-L, must uh, or may go fast. So anyway, you know, that was another thing. So, you know, St. George, when they had all those disasters that was um, that was pretty serious and uh, St. George actually did a erosion hazard zone ordinance and they also strengthened the shores so that that wouldn't happen again so they they did some really good mitigation efforts after that disaster so the point is is uh, public works is key in mitigating future losses you also have the fire we all remember these this is uh, the Santa Quinn mudslide um, so emergency management and public works. I think that this is pretty common. <clears throat> Both groups are the first to respond and the last to leave. And um, I hope that this has helped everybody a little bit. Uh, the USSC is a valuable tool and resource. I, we have a website. I've given you the website here. You don't need to type all that in if you want. You can just put into Google Utah Seismic Safety Commission or, or Utah USSC and it will pull you up and take you right to our website. And we have a lot of tools and um, materials right there on the website that you can look at. You can look at our meeting minutes and uh, pull from our resources that we have. And so what the Seismic Safety Commission continues to do is we really try to do outreach to everybody to mitigate uh, earthquake hazards. And with that, um, I will turn this over to any questions. Are there any questions that came up that you can have? So John, this is Mark Millett. I wonder, <laughs> um, you, you, you uh, showed those books uh, uh, and showed the Salt Lake uh, 
you know, re referencing the statistics on the Salt Lake section of the fault. And, and uh, uh, I was on just slightly late uh, getting in here. So if you could cover this, I apologize. But I guess so much of the time we talk about earthquake in, in, the, in the big broad sense of things. But, uh, you know, the, I think sometimes our discussion needs to be at least uh, understanding that there's a various segments right and, and as we look at those segments and, and uh, the, the fact is is there's never been a time when they historically have ever gone all at the same time doesn't mean we can't do something new right but uh, which is kind of good news to me because it's one of those things that that if that's the case then we, we still have local cavalry that can can come if, if, if it's the box elder Brigham City segment that goes uh, you know, then, then we've, we've potentially got resources out of Salt Lake, Utah County that's going to be able to come and help, right? If it's, if the Salt Lake segment goes or the Utah County segment goes, those are big because you got a lot more people there, right? You're, uh, and, and, and our toolboxes are fairly small, but we still can respond from these areas. So I just kind of a perspective I've, I've got on earthquakes in general, but my question specifically is, um, so that document that you showed there, is, is that document recreated for every segment of the Wasatch Fault that gives the specific information like you represented there for Salt Lake? Yeah. Great question, Mark. I'm glad you asked it. So the scenario document that you're referring to was for the Salt Lake City segment. So that was probably the worst case scenario. And um, if you go to our putting down roots document, um, just as a follow up, it, it does talk about those five different segments along the Wasatch Fault. And um, you are correct. So your, your segment up there where you live, the Box Elder Reber counties, that segment, it hasn't gone off for quite a while. So there's significant tension along the Wasatch Fault right now to have a magnitude seven earthquake. And uh, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, the likelihood of earthquakes and that, and it's pretty impossible for us to predict, you know, an earthquake. But um, that's why these mitigation efforts are so valuable and um, so important for us to respond to. And, you know, up there in, in your neck of the woods, Mark, um, you guys have a high percentage of unreinforced masonry homes yourselves. And, um, you know, so it, it's interesting to know I was talking to um, the engineer who, you know, works with all the temples and, you uh, you know, the, the box elder, the Brigham City Temple that they built up there, they built that to seismic, they, they built that above and beyond the code, the, the minimum code. So, you know, if they do have an earthquake up there, you know, they're looking at, you know, making sure that their buildings can be reopened and reused fairly immediately. And so, you know, if we do have an earthquake, uh, and, you know, Mark, you also brought up the comment about, you know, with all five segments, will they all break at the same time? And, you know, earthquakes are very hard to predict what they're going to do, but most likely, uh, you know, not all five sec segments would go in tandem with each other. So you're correct on that too. But um, when we're looking at, uh, you know, mitigating all this earthquake hazard risk, it's, it's interesting to note that um, we have, uh, you know, an, our, our earthquake fault along the Wasatch Fault, if, if you compare us to California, so they have, they have 10 times the population that, or seven times the population that we do, but um, we'd have 10, we would have 10 times the injuries and deaths that they would have, uh, serious injuries or deaths that they would. And part of that is because we have these unreinforced masonry buildings in our state. And uh, we haven't had a, a series of large earthquakes. We've had, you know, this moderate one was the largest one we've had along the Wasatch Fault in a very long time. And so, you know, a lot of our old buildings are, are, are not seismically retrofitted. When, they, um, when the pioneers came to the Salt Lake Valley, they, were, they had started building 700 adobe brick homes, which is just basically mud bricks. Um, when they immediately got here, they started building those, those buildings and they were not aware of the, the seismic risk that our state had. And it's interesting to note that out of those original 700 homes and buildings that they built today, there's over 300 of those adobe brick homes that are still standing. And it's just basically clay brick on clay brick. And, you know, if we had an earthquake, all those historical buildings would be lost. But um, I think it's important that we all recognize and understand that we do live in earthquake territory. 
in con earthquake country, and we need to be careful and mitigate for it in the future. And um, if we're doing this, and if we're mitigating properly, it'll protect life, life, property, commerce, and the environment. And uh, there's really no downside to mitigating for earthquake hazard risk. And I, I think that um, this little earthquake, or this moderate earthquake that we had last year, is such a great reminder for us to uh, really pay attention. And you know, I we're going to be offering some trainings um, in the future on on some seismic uh, safety and, and URMs. And uh, I would love to have emergency managers participate in that too. And we'll send those out on the emergency management uh, invite list as well. Are there, are there any other questions? I, I didn't mean to keep talking. I, I want to leave some time for other, other questions as well. Wait, sorry, John, just one piece, those booklets. I asked you, if, if, do you have those books created for each one of the segments or are you just for the Salt Lake? segment um yeah so the scenario report is just for the salt lake segment and a lot of the information could be interpreted and and used for yours as well but they did not do a particular scenario study for your segment mark all righty thanks We don't have any questions in the chat, so if anyone would like to put a question in the chat or you can use the raise hand feature or go ahead and unmute yourself if you would like to ask questions. Um, I would like to mention one thing about our the Applied Technology Council or ATC 20. ATC 20 is a course where we provide uh, training. It's a full day course where we provide training and uh, we allow people to go out and be building evaluators after an earthquake, where you red tag it, yellow tag it, or, or green tag a building following an earthquake. And um, those courses have kind of been put on hold until the pandemic because ends because we have a um, field element that we like to include with that. So right now, Utah has about 500 uh, building evaluators for an earthquake. Um, I, I know that there's quite a few emergency managers that have taken that course that um, took the training and they wondered why they were not called on this earthquake and it's it's every disaster is local and so um, they looked at you know the damages and this was just a moderate earthquake so it did stretch public works to their breaking point where they might have needed assistance from the evaluators but the community has decided with the pandemic and the liability going with that, that they would not make the request. So um, Salt Lake County and, and the communities, they were able to um, use their own resources and do all the building evaluations themselves. If Had the earthquake been just a little bit larger, we would have activated the, the cadre of um, building evaluators. And, and then, you know, just if any of you would like to have the ATC 20 course taught in your community, you can just contact me, John Crofts, and uh, would be glad to sign up and, and do a training in your community. I know we've done that with many of you already, but um, as of right now, we are not um, scheduling those courses until the pandemic comes under control a little bit more. So John, with those courses, are those for anyone to take? Can anyone become a building evaluator or do you need to be an engineer in public works? Yeah, so we have a, a tiered system. So when people go out and evaluate buildings, uh, we have people go for a variety of reasons with two at a time. So um, if you are the higher, if, you, if, you have, if you're a, a PE, a professional engineer or an SE and, and you have an engineering degree, you are able to evaluate uh, commercial buildings and um, do it at a higher level. So if you are not an engineer and you're not a licensed architect and you are not licensed with ICC, the international uh, with building codes, then you can um, take a lower tier rating. So typically what we would do if people are going out and there's you know commercial buildings and the community will arrange that who you go with, they usually would um, match up an engineer or you know, um, an architect with a non-engineer. So um, non-engineers can participate with that if they're credentialed and um, they are required to take the ICS 100 class through FEMA and they're required to do the ATC 20 training 
and that would determine what tier you are on uh, going out and doing your building evaluations. So if you're doing building evaluations um, and you're not an engineer and you're not an architect or licensed architect, then you would um, just be able to do residential buildings. But typically the way most communities do it is they want to match um, what you know people up. They want to do a, a non-engineer with someone else that is. And so uh, and when you go out, you are um, when you're evaluating, say, if you get called out to West Valley City to help them with their evaluations, you answer to West Valley City, and it's like you are under their umbrella, and then you do as they direct. So it's pretty useful. Um, the state of Utah, um, when we had the Wells earthquake, Wells is pretty close to Utah, the Utah border, so Utah went out and assisted Wells, and they helped them with um, some of their uh, evaluations as well so it's it's a pretty big, good program and the atc 20 program does fall underneath the ussc umbrella so the the ussc oversees that so good question thank you any other questions so we do have um a question in the chat it's from Mark again, just asking if you can send that, the breakdown of those tiers of the levels of uh, training that people can uh, be accredited at. Um, yeah, I can, um, I can uh, respond to that briefly. Uh, it's just, so there's two tiers right now. There's tier one and tier two. Tier one is the higher level with, you know, you being an engineer or a um, licensed architect or uh, certified with ICC. And then the second tier are those that are not. So um, right now we're looking at fine tuning that a little bit. You know, there's different types of engineers. We have mechanical engineers. Um, their specialty is a little different than a structural engineer. Or, you know, so we have different types of engineers. So what we're wanting to do is, you know, put a new barcode or a QR code onto um, our identification badges where you can just use your Apple iPhone or Android and read the QR code and it will bring up all your credentials. Um, you know, and other things as well, such as, you know, if you have other skills and abilities that could be useful to the community, such as a Spanish speaker, you know, so if the Hispanic community needs somebody to outreach, it would be helpful if people going out and doing the evaluations also speak Spanish. So, I mean, we want to expand that to make it a little bit more user-friendly for communities so that they know exactly what they're getting with these volunteer assessors that go out. Great, thanks. There's another question in the chat. Um, the question is, are there any other resources for homeowners other than the Utah Guide for Seismic Improvements for URM dwellings that are on the USSC website? that you can refer us to if we live in an older URM and want to mitigate our home's earthquake risk? Yes. Um, there are so many resources on that. And um, not only that, you know, please feel free to use my name, my phone number, um, jcrofts at utah.gov, 801-560-2637. Um, the Seismic Safety Commission has a lot of resources on their website. And um, there's also a lot of other materials that, you know, I would be happy to share with you. So absolutely. And then and next question in the chat. Um, the, we understand that the building inspector courses are on hold until COVID is over, but how do we access those or sign up for them when they are happening? So um, yeah, I, I think you're referring to the ATC 20 courses. Those are on hold. So you can contact me directly and um, I will let you know about those courses. We also advertise those within the communities. Typically we have um, you know communities that will sponsor that and they will advertise that and help get the information as, out as well. There is going to be an online ATC course that's coming up in the next few months. And um, that will be offered by the, um, the NETAP grant. I mentioned the ATC 20 course. That's an online course, but it will not have the filled element that Utah requires. So um, yeah, I, I would be happy to keep anybody in the loop on future courses. 
and we're hoping that this pandemic ends quickly and that we can start those up. So we're also considering other options that we, I, hopefully this thing just doesn't go on and on. We want the pandemic to end. I think I speak for everybody when I think, when I say we have pandemic fatigue, but um, it has delayed these courses and I wish there was something more we could do about it. But we, you know, this, the committee that oversees the, uh, the safety assessment committee that oversees the ATC 20 underneath the seismic safety commission, they believe that the field element is very important for people to participate in to be credentialed. Definitely. All right, are there any other questions? Well, thank you, John. I think that was really valuable information and I think there's a lot more that the Seismic Safety Commission does that I wasn't even aware of. So I appreciate your presentation today. As a reminder, this webinar and all other webinars in this series will be available on the DEM website at dem.utah.gov slash exercises or now at dem.utah.gov slash I wonder. Our webinar next week will be I wonder what is the Statewide Mutual Aid Act presented by John Jonna Whitesides. If you have any I wonder topic suggestions, please reach out to tbodily at utah.gov to have your topic added to our calendar. We're always excited to help you explore and get to know all that DEM can offer the emergency management community. Until next time, keep wondering. <laughs>